Dawn Wing will be presenting our last session. Uh, her session is called Poetic Research, Creative Interaction with Text and Image. Dawn Wing is the Media and Reader Services Librarian at SUNY Suffolk Community College, excuse me, SUNY Suffolk County Community College, College Library, Ammerman Campus. She serves as a State University of New York Librarians Association delegate and a contributing writer for the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. Dawn is passionate about promoting lifelong learning by facilitating engaging learning opportunities through media, creativity, and research. You can find more about Dawn's various projects at wingdawnlibraries.wordpress.com, and that link will be available on um, the page where these presentations will be provided uh, a few weeks after uh, today. Um, as well as some of the materials that Dawn will be um, talking about during her session. So thank you, Dawn, for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I'll just need you to uh, go ahead and click the green new share button and you'll be ready to go. Okay. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, looks great. Okay, okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dawn, and I'm going to present on poetic research, creative interaction with text and image. Well, what does that mean? Well, long story short, um, I am going to give you a bit of a background information on a course I taught with this experimental creative project I wanted students to do. So for three semesters, I have taught LIB 101, Introduction to College Research. It is a one credit, 10 week course that is required for human services majors. And it's also an alternative for college students to fulfill their college freshman seminar requirement. So in 10 weeks, we're covering a lot. Um, basically, you can see the learning objectives of this course. Uh, students are learning and uh, becoming proficient in important research skills, such as coming up with a research plan, coming up with research questions, extracting and refining keywords for their uh, database searches, um, knowing how to do an advanced Google search, and of course, being able to evaluate and cite information appropriately. So a lot for 10 weeks. Um, and how do we create this um, learning uh, project that makes it really engaging um, for students and meaningful for students. So a challenge that um, I've been working through for the past three semesters, starting in fall of 2015, was I'm, I was trying to think of ways to create a project where students would, again, learn and synthesize and apply these various research skills in a way that was fun and relevant. Um, and it's um, so I, I tried to brainstorm ways that was not repetitive um, and that was doable in such a short period of time. So assigning a research paper was out of the question. They uh, are expected to do that for their three credit courses where they have much more time to do thorough research um, and to really um, put together their uh, thoughts more clearly. Um, so I, I didn't want to give them another paper. That wasn't really realistic to expect from them. Um, also, I didn't want to torture them with yet another PowerPoint presentation, which I did have students do for my first two um, semesters when I taught this course. And I could tell it was a little bit too much, probably repetitive for the students. So I wanted to ditch that as well. So what did I ultimately come up with? Um, I became inspired by zines. I read and create these myself. Basically, they're short for magazines. And uh, the heyday of zines were during the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's when they were really popular, during the Riot Girl punk rock era. And the appeal of zines is the self-publication aspect and um, being able to express oneself and publish one's opinions directly and connecting to an audience. So I wanted some sort of hands-on project for my students. I wanted them to um, create a class publication that is a pure research guide. So I wanted them to um, reflect upon and also present their uh, findings for their research questions um, and present them in a way that's fun and engaging for their own peers. Um, so one part of this 
zine or this uh, class publication was to have my students um, look up uh, articles. So for the 10 weeks, I would basically give them a weekly assignment. So I broke down this project in a way that was do as doable. So a few weeks I did have students um, come up with a research question, keywords, do keyword search to find scholarly articles through library databases and Google. Um, and so from one of the assignments, they, uh, they could choose an article that they found either online or through a library database. And I wanted them to, um, to create a, a, a poem, a blackout poem. And this was inspired by Austin Kleon's newspaper blackout book and website. And it's pretty straightforward. So Austin Kleon is known for publishing advice to people who want to implement creativity in their everyday lives. And one way to do that is by appropriating newspaper articles um, that you have in print or online. And so you just take a part of an article or an entire article and you um, select certain words you want to keep to create a poem and you black out the rest. So you're appropriating something that already exists, something that contains information and recreating it into your own uh, literary work. So I, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, also, he has a website, newspaperblackout.com. Uh, you can look at other examples. So the previous example you saw was pretty simple, straightforward, but you can get as uh, whimsical or as visual as you want. Um, here we have a poem about pirates and this author um, wanted to be visual with it to highlight the theme of the poem and to also create these little linear, these wiggly pads to make it easier for a reader to read and understand the flow of, of a poem. Um, so in my case, for my students, um, I, every week I would always model, of course, um, the different skills I wanted them to learn. And so the theme of um, this, their research process was they had to come up with a question that had to do with technology and society. Um, and so I myself created a question uh, to demonstrate, you know, uh, throughout the weeks. And so my course was how can free diving uh, help researchers better understand marine life. And so I showed my students how to extract keywords from that question and look up an article. So I found this article on a library database called Free Diving to Tag Elusive Sharks. And I showed my students when I presented them with this project. I said, you know, I found this article. I'm going to choose a random section. Um, and this version of the poem, it was uh, only HTML text. So I just copied and pasted a section of that article into a Word document, as you see in front of you. And this is what it looked like after I blacked it out. So this, I know this is very fancy. I like to get all graphic and use technology and whatnot, but um, I didn't expect my students to, to do anything very fancy. But um, the first step I did was I used a Sharpie marker to black out the text um, and to create a poem. Um, and then I scanned that version um, and used Pixlr, which is basically a free online Photoshop tool, which I'm gonna show um, at the end of my talk. Um, I used that to superimpose a digital silhouettes of the fish. And I created these linear paths to make it easier for readers to read. Um, so I showed this as, a, as an example for what I wanted my students to do. Um, the next part I wanted my students to contribute was creating a keyword cloud page um, using taggle.com. Um, I did recommend say that they could use whatever uh, other word cloud tools. There are many of them online, like Boral.net. But I show them Taggle.com because, um, as you'll see at the end of this presentation, it's really easy to use, uh, very visual. Um, so I wanted my students to, um, during the 10 weeks of the course, to um, keep track of the various keywords and subject terms. Um, I had them identify and use throughout the weeks when they were looking for various sources. So I wanted them to put them together in a visual way so that whatever um, reader, um, another college student researcher, um, when they would come upon this page, it'd be really easy for them to remember the words that the student used in their research process. And the third part that I wanted students to um, contribute was a research reflection. So I gave them these guiding questions. I wanted them to just recount their experiences coming up with a research question, um, Boolean search strings that yielded 
uh, successful and relevant results, um, any new search tools or strategies they liked using or felt was really helpful that they didn't know about before, and lastly, recommendations they have for other students um, in terms of uh, being successful at research. Uh, I also created this rubric, so around week five, so during the midpoint of our course, I mentioned, I, you know, introduced them to them this project, and of course they had a rubric so that they were able to self-assess the skills, the proficiency in the skills I was asking them to present, um, and also letting them know that they are accountable for publishing quality work. Um, there were a number of students' pages I did not ultimately published because there were a lot of misspellings and I make it very clear in the rubric, hey, you know, this is something, this is work that you should be proud of um, showing uh, your peers. And so here's, again, these guidelines to make sure that you're on track for creating work that um, is uh, appropriate. Um, so for each part of the publication, um, you know, you can see the blackout poem, the word cloud, the research reflection, I gave a put in um, criteria and points. Um, I also obviously wanted them to include citation of the sources that they were required to find um, for each weekly assignment. And of course, they had to evaluate their sources using um, CRAP in this case. Uh, so here are some student examples. Uh, I two things I had students use I recommended they use pseudonyms and I also um, had them sign release forms giving me permission to publish their works online and in print um, so here's a student his pseudonym is Joseph um, Uno Breezy and he created a word cloud using taggle.com as you can see and his research question was on um, geothermal energy and its impact on the environment uh, here's another student's research cloud, which pertained to her question on chemotherapy and its impact on child patients. And another student's keyword cloud she created um, on her question pertaining to social media and its impact on college voters' perception of the past presidential election. Uh, and here I have example student article blackout poems. This student used Microsoft Word to blackout his poem on the addictive nature of technology among college students. Uh, here's another student's blackout poem. He printed out the article and by hand used a marker to um, blackout words in a linear fashion. So his poem was on technology and education. Um, here, another student also by hand uh, created this poem, and he also used a whiteout pen to do the, the dotted paths so that it's easier for, for students to read. Um, and his poem was on, I know it's hard to see, but his poem was on the addictive, uh, no, I'm sorry, his poem was on technology's impact on social interaction among youth. And lastly, this student created a poem on Facebook and its impact on family connections. So if you were looking to do some sort of project like this, um, here are some suggestions. Um, again, as I mentioned before, starting from day one, provide a theme to start off the research process so it helps students really be focused and not so lost. Um, so again, in my case, I had students start out with brainstorming, coming up with a research question on technology and society, really any aspect of it. My second suggestion is because I, I only had 10 weeks and it, we were very tight on time, to scaffold teaching the research skills um, through weekly assignments. So each week the students would practice a new research skill and would are asked to find a uh, particular kind of resource, and they can use the resources they find for this final project. So it's really efficient. I'm not really asking them to do a lot more outside of the classroom. Um, another thing I suggest is introducing the final project as early as possible. <laughs> that way students can process and better visualize and understand what they're being asked to produce by the end of the semester. If possible, provide project examples of your own creation or of previous students' works. 
Um, in my case, this is the very first time I did this type of project, so it was still pretty abstract to most of my students. Um, however, with my own examples, um, they were able to have some sort of reference. And finally, again, I highly recommend constructing a rubric uh, that holds every student accountable for the quality of work that they submit. And again, also, it's a good way for them to self-assess and um, understand uh, what skills that they have learned since the beginning of the semester and how well they're doing it. So challenges, again, I did have a couple of students even after I introduced the project and talked about it um, after week five of our uh, time together. Um, a lot of them were still thinking that they were writing a paper. Um, and I said, no, we're not writing a paper. And again, because I had never done a project like this before, I didn't have a previous class example, but now I do. So in the future, when I teach this course again, I have something concrete to show students so they have a clear understanding of what they will be producing. Um, and here are other copies uh, I made. So basically, I took the student submissions and using a department photocopier, I generated these booklets. Um, the size of it is about five by um, whatever eight and a half by 11 is in half when you fold it in half is the size of these booklets. Um, and actually, the last day of class, I had my students help assemble these booklets. Um, we did a little read aloud and there was a little bit of a celebration of uh, their work um, and they got to take a copy home. And here's what the inside of these uh, research guides look like. Here's a, an example blackout poem and word cloud a student made. And here is a sample research reflection with citations portion. And I did have extra copies left over. And what I did with it was I placed it um, in this public area along with our other library resources, pamphlets, and publications so that you know, any student passing by can take a copy of my class, of the class uh, research guide. Um, so that ends the portion of my um, talk. Uh, I'm going to go back to my contact page, but I'm going to briefly show you Taggle.com and Pixlr, which were tools I mentioned in my presentation. So um, let's see if you can see the show. I think it's here. Oopsie. So I'm going to show you Taggle.com. And if you can't see it, please let me know. Um, Looks good, Don. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're at Tallow.com. It's really easy to start an account. So I'm on my accounts page. And I'm going to click on Create. And I'm going to use my research question on free diving and tagging sharks for research. Um, so here on the left side under the Words menu, you just put in various keywords. Um, so my I showed this to my students very briefly in class and none of them had questions. Uh, most of them use this tool and I think they had a lot of fun. And the reason is, as you can see, it's um, really easy to use. It's customizable. Um, so I'm entering the keywords of my research question. Um, you can change the size of a word to highlight uh, the importance or the frequency it was used during a search. So I want to um, maybe all in large free diving. That was a term I used a lot. And shark came up frequently. Um, you can change the color. Um, it's very visual, as you can see. Um, just choosing random colors. Oopsie. Oh, it's not working. Uh, angle, uh, you can have rotate your words, 90 degree or whatever angle. Um, and you can change the font of your various words. Um, you can actually see, you can change the fonts, but you don't actually know what the fonts look like, which I guess is the downside of this. You're just going to have to play around. Um, and you, then you click visualize so that you can see what the word cloud looks like. Um, oh, one last thing I forgot to show was the, the key thing I think a lot of my students liked 
doing was um, putting their word clouds into shapes, um, as you saw in the examples. So you can use these icons that are provided to you already, or you can add an image from online. So here I already did a search for a shark silhouette graphic. I copy the URL, go back to Taggle, I paste it, and I load it, and I'm going to select it, and I'm going to visualize again. And now I have a shark word cloud, so it's pretty cool. Um, so I can save changes, and um, it's saved into under my clouds. Um, and it's really easy to print. I can either click print here. Um, I have a Mac, so um, I think it's easier and more visible than PCs to, to print. Um, you can also download by going on the left side click on download and share. Um, I'll just spare you unnecessary clicking. Um, there are paid plans. The free plan to download is this standard quality download PNG image option. Um, so you can save your image that way onto your computer. And, um, and also emailing works as well. It'll give the sender a PNG um, attachment of your word cloud. Um, and I know we just ran out of time. Do we have, to, can I show Pixlr? Is that something I could show for a minute or two? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so Taggle, uh, th that was Taggle.com for the keyword cloud portion. Uh, and I'm gonna show you Pixlr, so you can uh, type in pixlr.com. And when you get to the website, um, you're going to scroll down and look for the Pixlr editor uh, uh, option and click on launch web app. And so if you, again, if you use Photoshop before, it's very, very similar. If not, I'm going to show you some basics. Um, and I've already started an account, so I have some images saved in my library, but as you can see, you can open an image from a computer, from your computer, from online. So um, as I mentioned before, I did a blackout poem by hand and I have the scanned image here. So I'm gonna open that. And what I'm showing you is I wanna superimpose a, a shark silhouette on this poem. So, oopsie, sorry. Went to open image library. So I'm going to use that same shark I found online and use for my word cloud and use it here. So um, basically, whenever I want to edit an image, a good habit to be in is in this layers window, you want to click on the lock to unlock it. And that makes it easier for me to, it makes it free for me to edit. So I want to get rid of this white background where the shark image is so that um, when I superimpose it, the background doesn't show up. So there's a, a wand, magic wand tool. And what this does is that wherever I hover on this background, it'll select on um, anything that has the same color. And tolerance on this um, top left corner, it's basically the larger the number, the more um, area coverage uh, you will be selecting. So I usually suggest 40. Um, so I'm going to hover my magic wand on anywhere in the background, click on it, go to edit, and cut. And I got rid of the white background. Um, second step, I want this shark to be white so that when I superimpose it on my blackout poem, um, it'll show up. You can see it. So I'm going to select the bucket, paint bucket tool, and on the bottom of the uh, toolbar here, I'm going to click on the uh, palette, this white palette, so that um, whatever I paint will turn white. So I'm just gonna pour this paint bucket over the shark and it's a white shark. So I'm gonna go to edit and I'm gonna select all. And then I'm gonna go to edit and copy the shark. Go to my blackout poem, edit and paste. And there we go. Uh, so it's a little too big. So I'm gonna edit, free transform, meaning I can resize, rotate, reposition my shark. Um, on the page to how I see fit and press enter. Um, so lastly, I want to save this. Um, you can save it in your Pixlr library or save it on your desktop. 
if you're ready to print it. Um, and it, you do have various formats to choose from. I usually just stick with JPEG. And then I click OK. And it's going to save to my desktop. Um, so that's, I know that was a very, very speedy tutorial with Pixlr. Um, like Carrie said in her presentation with Canva, I just encourage folks to play around. And if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to assist. It's a really awesome tool. Um, again, none of my students use this. Um, I didn't expect them to, but um, if you do have students who are, you know, graphic design students or more comfortable with technology or if you have more time with your students, um, I definitely suggest this as a tool um, to for them to explore because it's free and um, you know it just encourages uh, a lot more interaction with text and image. So um, that's all I have for now. So I'm going to just pull up my uh, contact information for folks to see. Uh, are there any questions? It looks like we've got a question um, anonymous viewer asks, are students entering the keywords into Taggle after they do searches or before? Oh, I'm reading the question. It might be uh, cool to, uh, okay. uh -huh. <laughs> do you want me to read I'm it again? I'm just going to read it out loud for the okay. rest of the, the okay. audience. Um, the, the, the person also says, it might be cool to do a before and after to see if the size importance of keywords changes as they look through results and finesse their search. Oh, that's a that's a cool experiment. That's very interactive. No, I, I only had my students uh, enter the keywords after they did searches. Um, but if I did have more time, I would I would totally integrate an assignment where they do it before and after. I think that's a great idea um, just for them to be more cognizant and um, aware of um, as they do research kind of what keywords are more relevant, become more relevant, or kind of looking at uh, compare, doing a compare and contrast with database searching in Google, or you know, uh, maybe doing a controlled kind of observation, you know, between two library databases, seeing you know, Academic Search Complete versus, I don't know, a subject specific database like Science Direct or something. I think that that's. That's cool. I didn't think of that, but whoever asked, that's an awesome, that's an awesome idea. You could do that. <laughs> anyway, I ramble. Um. <laughs> does it, does I, anybody else have any questions? I have a, a question for you, Dawn. Um, sure. I was wondering if, if you host a repository of the works created by your students um, that you just showed, or if you've had any discussions or, or pursued that channel. Oh, um, that was definitely something in mind that I ultimately would like to do. You mean digitally, like have it online? Yes. Yeah, there's a cool, oh, there's another tool called, um, I don't know if anyone has used it before. It's called ISSUU. I don't know how to pronounce it. Let me try to share it. It's like an online. Well, yes. Have you used it, Bill? I haven't, but I've seen it. Yeah, um, that's like a cloud-based one. It, it's free. I've used it before for my own work. Um, me, I, I was thinking that would be an option, but institutionally, my uh, Suffolk Community College, um, we're still working on starting our own digital archives. So once that started, once we have that up and running, yes, I would like to have their publication digitized and available. Um, at least institutionally. But isssuu.com issue is um, something that anybody can um, sign up and create an account and um, upload their digital and print publications so that it could be distributed and shared more widely. Um, let me try to share the screen here for folks to see. Um, yeah, here we are. I'm trying to see if they're, yeah, so these are very, you have some very posh, professional looking ones, um, but there, I've seen zines, I've seen people with self-publications um, share their work through this platform. Oh, uh, well, what are zines anyway? Um, and it's really, really cool. It's like you can turn the pages, like as if you were, if you had them in your hand. So this is what it looks like. 
Um, so yeah, when once the the semester winds down, if I have the time, I may consider this as an option. Um, but that's an excellent question. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, we've got another anonymous viewer says, "Hi, Dawn. Great stuff so far. Listening at work with another librarian, and then they write while eating pizza." <laughs> I think I know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I work with these people. <laughs> I suspect. <laughs> um, I am not. Any, eating anybody food. else? Oh, you're not eating pizza. I'm not eating pizza. <laughs> I will on Monday. That's yeah. <laughs> This is, this is information people don't need to know, <laughs> but there is a yeah. there is a meeting I will be having with other li <laughs> other librarians, and we will be having pizza and garlic knots. That is a surprise to me. Um, I think you need to share enough for the whole webinar community here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, I have another question for you. Um, I okay. thought that it was really awesome that you could link directly to the image when you were using um, your that word, word cloud software. Um, I was wondering if you saw any common themes that were used by your students or like reoccurring images that students were using. No, they actually each use something different. Um, and even though a lot of them had similar questions, so technology and society, I so what I do at the beginning of the course is I show them a brief five minute video. Uh, and I, I'm biased, so I like Stephen Colbert. I like humor. So and he's very uh, captivating, right? So I choose one of his videos and he talks about social issues and technology a lot. So I chose a video where he's interviewing MIT professor Sherry Turkle, and she talks a lot about, um, you know, psychology and technology and whatnot. And so I showed this clip of, of their interview and I have students immediately brainstorm, like just free write for five minutes of their responses, reactions to the video, and from their responses come up with research questions. So a lot of times because of the nature of the video, um, most, a lot of students will have very similar questions like um, technology addiction or um, thinking about um, their peers and how they use their phones and how it impacts face-to-face relationships and whatnot. But um, even though it, there, that was a common question this semester as well, um, no, they all chose different um, images for their word clouds. So that was nice. And I think thanks cool. to Google Images, there's just a plethora of, <laughs> of images. So that probably lessens the likelihood of someone choosing, two people choosing the same images. Well, thank you for that. Does anyone else have any last questions for Dawn? Give it another minute. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. Um, so, so Dawn shared a lot of her resources uh, with me to post on the website. So those will be on the um, the SUNY Law uh, website with all of these um, cropped video presentations. Um, Jennifer Smather says, thanks to the presenters and the organizers. Yes, thank you everyone who, who was a presenter um, today. Um, Dawn, do you have anything that you'd like to add before I, I switch back over? Uh, no, uh, I had sent you um, the packet of the various materials that I used uh, with my students. So that's linked on the SUNY Law website. It will be as soon as we get these presentations up. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to throw that out there in case people wanted to download those uh, materials and adapt them. So that's totally cool with me. Just, yeah, do whatever you want with the documents. Um, and yeah, I did include, um, I believe, I don't remember if I included student examples, but if anyone wants to, you know, show the examples of my students' works so that their students can better understand um, how to create these word clouds or poems, that's totally fine by me. Well, thank you very much, Don. And then thanks for sharing all those awesome tools. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I'd just like to wrap up today's conference. Thanks for, for everybody who's joined us today and, and who stuck around for the afternoon. Um, I want to give a big thank you to the conference planning team, Michelle Eichelberger at Genesee Community College, Roseanne Humes at Nassau Community College, 
Rebecca Hyams at SUNY Maritime College, and Jill Ocasio at SUNY Optometry. I want to remind everybody that uh, the call for proposals has been extended. Um, I mentioned this in our uh, morning session. Um, proposals are now due Tuesday, February 14th. You can submit your proposal at sunilaw2017.wordpress.com. Our theme this year is the global community, and we'll be having this at Stony Brook University June 14th through June 16th. Um, it looks like there's just a couple chat things here. Uh, let's see, wow, got a lot of thank yous. Becky Burke, thank you. It was all fascinating. Thanks for all the hard work. Adele, wonderful conference. Thank you. Rebecca Noose, thanks everyone. Great presentations. Joyce Rambo, thank you so much. And Christy Lee, thank you all. Great work. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Have a great afternoon and a great weekend.